So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on a beautiful day. I'm pretty sure everybody wants to be outside. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zia Yang. I'm with um, the Small Business Development Center at UW Students Point, um, SBDC for short. Um, we are a network of centers throughout the state. Um, we're also located um, all over um, the nation. So there should be at least one SBDC in each state, uh, but for Wisconsin specifically, we have 14 centers and most of us are located on a UW campus. Um, so just a little bit about our SBDC. Um, we offer no cost of business consulting, um, you know, helping businesses start, manage, finance, grow or market their business. Um, we also offer uh, free uh, programs such as today's program and some fee-based programs as well. Um, for our network, we also have uh, specialized um, consulting services, such as uh, such as our uh, free digital marketing clinic and at UW Oshkosh, um, and um, other specialists um, in our network. Um, and then also, I just wanted just to do a shout out to our um, program partner, Nicolay College. Um, we are hosting this um, presentation, but Nicolay College is one of our partners that is helping to fund this program. Um, that way we can offer this program free to our registrants. So just a shout out to Nicolay uh, and the SBA. Um, so thank you so much for letting me do a little spiel about our SBDC. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ben Bauer. He is the Executive Director for um, Exclamation Services out of Marshfield, and he will be our presenter today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I was telling Zia uh, before we got started, I was on a golf course manning a uh, sponsorship hole uh, earlier today. It was really tough to leave the course, but um, I had to say yes to that opportunity because it was such an awesome Wisconsin day. So, um, but uh, we uh, only have about an hour, so I'm gonna dive right in and get us going. Uh, and again, just wanted to say thanks so much to everyone for, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna uh, share my screen. I'll do my best to stop the share so we can see each other, those of us that are on camera and stuff. Of course, we'd love to see you, but I get it. A lot of us are winding down our work day or maybe even commuting and stuff like that. So just happy that you're here. If you can share your video, great. If not, uh, it's all good. Um, do your best to engage in the chat and things like that uh, while you can. But also, um, there will be a couple of times to uh, share and interact with each other. Um, please feel free to unmute and uh, we'd love to hear from all of you as we uh, get going. Uh, It looks like we might have lost Ben here. So just hold on a moment. Oh, there you go. Good. Sorry. Yep. Okay. It's fine. Oh. Awesome. Okay, so um, just uh, thought it'd be worth doing some quick uh, introductions um, to save time instead of going like around the horn and doing all of this. Um, we uh, let's just do it in the chat if you have the ability to go ahead and throw this information in uh, the chat. Uh, while I'm kicking things off here, please do uh, just your name, uh, the business or organization that you're with, uh, and something fun to share. I threw a suggestion out there, maybe the best part of your job, the thing that you love the most about you do, uh, most about what you do. It'd be cool to hear from everyone there. Uh, and we'll just do that in the chat as we're going here. Take your time, uh, and hopefully we'll learn a little bit about each other as we uh, get going. Uh, 
uh, for the rest of the evening. So I also wanted to share just a little bit about exclamation and why I'm the dude that's here talking to you about this uh, customer persona stuff. So um, what I have on the screen here is our mission statement. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, when I talk about who I am and what I do and why I do what I do, uh, it's pretty easy for me to point to our mission statement, uh, doing what we love uh, to make you look great together. Um, you know, that's really writ uh, written really intentionally. Um, I love that I get to do a job where I get to say I, I do what I love and I, I really do and I mean that. Um, and that word together at the end is also really intentional too. We really do see that the people that we work with um, uh, as partners, as collaborators, uh, as partners in crime, whatever term you want to throw uh, at it, um, we, we really just love to be able to work with people and for people to help them do what they do. Uh, and as the rest of it says, we're uh, the easiest way to describe us is we're a creative marketing agency. Um, we've got a focus uh, in the credit union space, uh, also um, small businesses and nonprofits. Those are kind of the three main verticals that uh, we work uh, uh, do work for. Uh, and uh, you know, these all three of these kind of like check a big box for me emotionally, right? Uh, you know, I love the credit union model being uh, not not for profit financial institutions, really collaborative industry, credit unions sharing information all the time, um, working together to help um, lift the whole industry. Um, small businesses, of course, um, actually, before being with credit unions and with our uh, creative agency, uh, I ran my own small business uh, printing and marketing company for about 12 years. So uh, I imagine that uh, some of the uh, successes and good vibes, as well as some of the challenges that you all have faced, uh, I probably have uh, seen some of that along the way as well. Uh, and nonprofits, you know, some of the most underrated organizations that exist on the planet doing really uh, important and life changing work uh, for our communities. So really, it's an honor to help uh, serve those uh, folks as well. Uh, and uh, none of this is possible without a team. So just uh, I, I always like to take a moment to um, flash the pretty faces of all the people that I work with, because um, uh, it takes a team to do the work that we do. So I'm happy to work with all of these big bright minds that you're seeing on the screen there. So um, again, another opportunity to share. If you want to just drop it in the chat, feel free to do that just to um, get a bit of conversation going. That said, if you're so inspired and you want to unmute and share something uh, now, I'll take a quick pause here. But um, let's do a quick gut check. Like, why are you here tonight? Um, why do you think it's important to understand uh, creating personas or uh, how to develop them, how to use them, how to leverage them. So if you've got a minute or a thought on there uh, or on that topic, um, why are you here tonight or why is creating customer personas important to you, go ahead and drop that in the chat. Again, no pressure, uh, but also if anyone wants to unmute, uh, I'll wait for just a second in case there's a brave soul out there that wants to share something. Hi, I'll unmute really quickly and let you know what I think of that. So um, I... For me, I want to ensure that I understand my customer persona from the employer perspective, as well as my customers. So doing the due diligence to find out who my customer is, what their ages look like, and who my employers are and what their business strategies are, are important to me, especially when it comes to any type of messaging I'm putting out. So anything from a flyer to a social media post to even a telephone call or, or an email that I'm sending, I want to make sure I'm using the tone that they're accustomed to. And I also want to make sure that I'm presenting it in ways that they are looking to make that connection and build that rapport with them. And so with that being said, from the social media perspective, I want to ensure that as I build my clients and my employers and whoever else I'm working with, that my tone is always professional and it's always brought to meet um, what they're looking for. So I might have a different tone on Instagram than I do on LinkedIn. And my Facebook tone might be another a more colorful aspect than my um, than my Twitter presence. So, and this is Janine, by the way. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Janine, thanks for sharing. And I see in the chat, you're starting uh, your business here in Wisconsin. Can you tell us just a little bit about what the business is, what you do? Um, yeah, as long as no, I mean, I don't want you all to have to sign an NDA. So um, what I'm doing is um, I am going to be providing strategic pop-up hiring events for um, people not only in the military community, but outside of the military community who are 
looking to get hired within 60 days and uh, providing a workshop to prepare the employee, the, the specific candidate for the hiring event that morning and also presenting to the employer how the rules of success to help them bring on proper, um, the right talent at the right time for the right jobs. So there it is in a nutshell. Yeah, cool. Nice elevator pitch. Well done. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. So. Anyone else? We maybe we'll take a minute for one more if anyone else wants to share. Yeah, I'm I'm the old guy in the bunch here. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm just wondering. I'm uh, sometimes it's just a matter of of choice of words, but um, is this any different than creating what I would have called back in the day creating a brand? Yeah, I think this will definitely be much different than creating a brand. I mean, yeah. understanding your persona maybe helps contribute to building a brand or. Uh, positioning your brand, but um, yeah, I would say this is an aspect of it or quite different than building a brand. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you for sharing and thanks everyone for putting uh, all the great info in the chat. I'll try and keep up uh, all night on all that. Uh, so thanks again. So yeah, as I was developing this presentation, I really, you know, for me, uh, something that I commonly try to do is take a minute and start with the why, take a breath and think about what I'm, you know, keep the uh, the end in mind and think about what I'm trying to do here, right? So I, I just use this statement that you're seeing on the screen as um, kind of my uh, purpose statement for what we're going to be doing tonight. And uh, I, I believe that everything that we're going to talk about tonight contributes to this. So um, you know, really understanding that our persona that we're developing or personas are really the key that unlocks the door to connecting deeply with our target audience and uh, all in an effort to create success and satisfaction, whether that's through marketing or your customer experience that you're trying to create or build uh, or improve in some way. So um, I try to keep this statement uh, front and center as I was developing everything that we're working on for tonight. Um, but everything that you guys all just shared too was was really great. So thanks again. So um, this might look familiar. You maybe saw this when you registered or signed up tonight. I won't read it all uh, through you, but we've got uh, really three main objectives, right? Understanding persona development, talking about the process, um, how to create one, what needs to go into that process, uh, and then leveraging them, doing something with them after you've created it. Uh, and then how this is really an ongoing cycle and we update and refine personas over time because I don't know if you know this, but the world moves fast, things change all the time, and this isn't something that we can just create, uh, be aware of, sit on a shelf, and then uh, never think about again. You know, it's really something that we need to um, continue to um, work on, and it's a really uh, evolve, uh, evolving process over time. So, um, and also just one thing I want to note, I'm going to probably talk too fast tonight, I'll do my best, um, but all of this takes time, uh, and it's a process, and, you know, really, you get what you give when it comes to persona development. So, maybe you want to simply define the persona of your most likely client or uh, a new segment you're trying to break into, uh, and it stops with just defining that one persona, that's cool, that'll be a win if that's what you get from tonight. Um, and then from there, you can dig deeper, create more personas, update and refine, do more research and all the uh, awesome stuff that we'll be talking about tonight. So I hope my, my intention is definitely not to overwhelm. So um, if you take one thing from tonight, just know that you can take an, you know, a, a small piece or a nugget of tonight and probably change something that you're doing in your business and it'll wind up being a win. So um, Here's our structure for tonight. We're already kind of diving into understanding our why and talking about why we're here. We're going to talk about uh, persona development and why it's even beneficial. Uh, we're going to definitely dig into some of the research and data that goes into that process, how we can create our persona. Um, I'm going to share tools throughout the night, but I have a whole bunch of stuff at the end that um, will hopefully be things that'll be beneficial for you to take with you. Uh, and I'll share all of that, including the slide deck with Zia. Uh, and in a recap email, you'll get all the tools that I'm talking about. Um, you'll get the slide deck and stuff. So uh, don't feel like you need to rapid fire notes either. You'll, you'll get all that stuff uh, in a recap. And then I'll share just a couple of examples. I could probably share hundreds of examples of how clearly some companies are putting some time into thinking about their audience and developing personas and it's influencing their marketing messages 
I'll share some kind of big brand examples and then some local examples too that I think just um, drive home a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. So, okay, so developing a persona, let's start with what a persona even is. And really it's a, it's a representation of your ideal customer or uh, the next customer that you're trying to capture based on real data about their age, their gender, income level, job title, and a whole bunch of other factors. Those are maybe some of the more obvious, but there are a lot of other ways to define or segment uh, or create your customer persona that aren't on aren't based on some of those really, I guess what I would say are maybe more obvious demographic factors like age, gender, and income level and things like that. Um, but really creating one really just allows you to better understand your target market, craft marketing messages that really resonate with them. Um, and they're really also great for uh, I'll say sales teams, but I also understand you might be the sales team, right? Um, you know, but by understanding your persona, they'll really understand what's important to each distinct uh, audience or post or person, right? So, you know, for example, engineers probably care a lot more about technical specs than marketers. It's important to know that that that's just one benefit of understanding who you're targeting or who your persona is. Um, so, what you see on screen are three. I think the three most obvious. Um, reasons why you'd want to put the work into developing personas. These are three outcomes that can come out of it, right? So guiding business decisions. They can really do that by providing extremely valuable insights and understanding of your target audience. So, um, you know, some results that might come of that are targeted marketing strategies where, you know, the personas help build, help businesses create targeted marketing campaigns by um, understanding specific needs, preferences and behaviors of different customer segments. Hey Ben, uh, sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I think it's it's uh, pertinent to what you're talking about right now. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. So great question, Don. Um, I think uh, the, the big difference is with a target audience, you're using um, big buckets of information and you're defining an audience. You're developing a whole lot of, uh, you're developing an understanding of a whole lot of people. And what we can do with that target audience is develop a persona that maybe that person or that persona that we're creating is a uh, a member of that audience or a member of that community that we're talking to. And by developing a persona and doing some of the exercises and uh, front end work that goes into creating the persona, um, we understand the person, the individual a bit better than we maybe do the whole audience. So it really helps us dive a bit deeper, put ourselves in the shoes of the person that we're uh, trying to attract or get to buy from us or get information from us, whatever it might be. Um, and by doing it on that more personal level, um, there's just there's a deeper understanding than there is of understanding big bucket of people that have these tendencies or um, uh, high level information that helps build up a target audience. That's what I would say is the big difference. So great question. All right, chat is open. I'll try and catch future chats before I just keep rambling. Um, so yeah, um, maybe it's new product development or uh, a new experience that you're trying to create, which could be something like walking into your store if you have a storefront or um, if you have an online presence, what does it look like for them to show up uh, at your virtual doorstep? Um, we already mentioned like sales and customer service, getting to know personas, you know, really, um, helps understand how different people, you know, and, and that's a, that's a really important word because what we're talking about are people, humans, right? How they prefer to be approached and engaged. Um, and I think maybe just again, to reinforce the target audience question, you know, when we think about the members of that audience as people, as humans, and not just data, not just buckets of data, we think about them a little differently. Um, personas can also help give us some insight into um, maybe market expansion or new uh, groups or areas that we're targeting. Um, we know that we have an opportunity to go into this area, whether it's a geographic area or a new line of work and developing a persona within that audience uh, helps us think about them uh, on a more personal and deeper level and create experiences for them. Uh, humanizing target audiences, uh, definitely um, a, a great outcome of creating personas um, and really shifting the focus from abstract segments or, uh, you know, get, I guess, again, back to the target audience question to individuals with unique characteristics, unique needs and aspirations. 
Um, and, you know, it's it's a bit of a dance, right? Because we know that if we focus in too far on the persona or this one person that we're defining and really understanding who they are, their individual behaviors and stuff, we might get too focused in on this person and forget about some other people in the audience that are also potential buyers or are, you know, right maybe adjacent to the persona that we're creating uh, content or experiences for. Um, so how do we how do we do those things while keeping that persona front and center while also not excluding anyone else that, um, you know, is right in the target that we're trying to go with or go after as well. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about empathy and understanding tonight and personas really help uh, develop empathy towards your target audience by really delving into the um, to the mindset and experience of different personas, we really gain a better understanding of their goals, their challenges, their emotions. Um, and, uh, you know, this really on this, this understanding really fosters empathy and really helps businesses tailor all of those things that we've mentioned already, product services, marketing messages to address specific needs and aspirations, what the, what the customer, uh, wants. Um, so really, by by humanizing our target audiences, uh, we shift our perspective from that generalized market segment to real people with unique uh, identities and unique needs. So it's really a human-centered approach. Uh, and all of this helps create uh, an enhanced understanding of who we are as a business, what we're trying to do, who our clients are, who our potential clients or customers are, uh, and what they need. So um, I like to back up a lot of this as much as I can of this stuff with just a little bit of data. There's been some research that uh, has proven that customer or I'm sorry, that um, businesses that spend a bit of time in this work by developing personas and, um, you know, thinking with empathy and developing their processes and their products and their experiences with things like empathy and the, the persona in mind, um, it's good for business, right? So a few stats that, have, that came from a um, a uh, research uh, report that Dell.ai uh, did. Um, I won't cover all of these, but you know they all look really good, right? You know, increased click-through rates, higher conversion rates, and everything. Um, you know, and I'm sure when you're doing this kind of research, you want to focus on the uh, good outcomes that uh, come of the research. But it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're going after two different people and you understand one of them and you don't understand the other, like which one are you likely going to have more success with? So um, it feels so obvious, but also um, it's not easy, you know, and it takes time and it takes a lot of front end work to um, to connect with people in the way that they need to be connected with that makes them want to do what you're asking them to do, which might be buying from you or learn something about you. So, um, and you know, these again are those uh, big benefits of um, of diving into this persona work. Um, we've talked about most of this already, um, and that increased engagement is kind of the big bucket um, that uh, we'll focus on for most of tonight. And again, that could mean different things to different businesses. It might be a sales and conversion tactic. It might be more just satisfaction. We know that. Uh, hypothetical business, the people that are coming into our uh, shop, they they need to have a better experience. So we're going to focus on this person that uh, we know will likely be there and we'll craft the experience for them and the rest of our customers are going to uh, benefit from it, right? And all of this, all of this stuff just helps build loyalty, which is something that every business or every organization wants. We want people coming back to us so these are the steps uh, necessary to help um, build our persona. Um, research, analyze, we actually create the persona. And then, like I mentioned in the beginning, we validate and, and um, refine because it really um, it, it takes time and it's always changing. So conducting that research to gather relevant data on the target audience. Um, so to, to conduct research and gather relevant data um, we need to start by defining clear objectives to guide our efforts, to guide what we're doing. So we need to, um, and, and this is different for every business, for every organization, every person, and we don't have unlimited resources or time. So, you know, I'm going to name a few tools here that you might use to do some of this research. You don't have to do it all. Um, so they could include things like surveys, uh, interviews, focus groups, um, and uh, 
you know, we might not be able to do all of those things, but maybe we could do one of them. Maybe we could develop a survey to learn something from our current clients or a survey to learn something from people who have visited us but haven't bought. Um, so, um, you know, those are just a few tools that you can use to kind of start to do some of that research. We'll talk about more in a little bit too, but um, when we create our detailed profiles or personas, it's really based on information that we've collected, some that we might already have, uh, and some of it that we might need to get through some of these tools like surveys or interviews or focus groups. So we'll talk in a little bit about how uh, different data sources uh, that you might have access to right now uh, that some of you could use to create personas or to start to do some of this research really quickly. So um, after we do some of that research, next step is analyze it. Let's start to understand it. So review what we've collected, organize it into manageable chunks or segments. Um, so this might be demographic information, preferences or behaviors. Uh, and then we want to identify some patterns or some trends, commonalities, you know, along the way that hopefully we identify something that says, yeah, that's if we're going into this unclear as to what kind of persona we might be developing or who specifically we're trying to create for, um, hopefully we can identify a trend or something in this initial research that we're doing to say, yeah, okay, this is the person that I need to focus on. And it could be based on any number of fa uh, factors. Um, could be demographic, like their income level associated with the fact that they're already a customer of yours. How do we focus in on that? Could be completely different um, uh, characteristics that help say, yep, that's the person I need to focus on. And then we use that uh, information to develop um, the persona that represents the segment uh, or the target audience that we're going after. So we'll talk about creating the persona real soon, including some of the tools to help you get there, um, because it, be it can become overwhelming really quickly. Uh, and a tool or a guide that can help keep you focused on what matters most is really helpful in this process. So there will definitely be some of that uh, coming up in just a little bit. And then, like I said, validate and redefine. It's always a good idea to regularly update personas, especially as your business grows or expands. Um, and uh, you should... Uh, if the persona you wrote in the beginning are still, uh, you should update even if the persona that you um, created in the beginning is still relevant now, it's still time to, that, that's still a good time to update and refine. So um, maybe a question that you're feeling right now is, wait, like, do I really, do I really need a persona? Um, some of you might think like my products or my services um, that I put out there are for everyone. Um, so like, I don't know if it's really beneficial for me to like identify in on one persona or create something that's quite so specific. Maybe you've heard something like, you know, if you sell, uh, if you sell to everyone, you sell to no one, that might be the like cliche tongue in cheek sort of phrase, but I think there's some truth in that. Um, so um, I do think that even if what you create or put out in the world really doesn't have any kind of exclusivity to it. It really can be for anyone. It's still really beneficial to focus on the group of people that you think might benefit from it most or are most likely to buy it or get it from you um, to just help encourage growth and um, you know make sure that the people that really need the thing that you're uh, selling or putting out there um, get it. And then uh, if the people adjacent to them get it too, that's a win for the business. So um, your services and products will have a target uh, and it's about tapping into that to create uh, those personas and creating marketing and experiences that are for everyone means that you really risk um, that they won't resonate with your actual audience, with the people that need to buy from you and the business could suffer because of that or the organization. Okay, so quick check-in. Again, um, no pressure if you wanna throw something in the chat, something you've learned, something you, maybe you want to dig more into or try right away. If something feels impossible, if you're feeling overwhelmed already, share it. That might be my cue to slow down. Um, or if there's something you know you want to hear about next, um, hopefully I'll be able to do that in the next 30 minutes. So I'm going to keep rolling um, just for the sake of time since we only have 30 minutes, but um, please put that stuff in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it and hopefully hit on it as we wrap up here. So um, that first part of the process, research and data, there's a couple different uh, kinds of information that we can get, quantitative and qualitative, right? And something that I think it's overlooked really often is the 
we already have, the information that we already have. So maybe that's like your own point of sale system, your own email database. Maybe it's even your accounting software, QuickBooks or spreadsheets, however you're doing all of that. You've got information on people that have already interacted with you uh, or maybe already bought from you. So don't overlook that information because you've got it already. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to create a focus group or a survey to get it or anything. You have it. Maybe it needs a bit of refinement or maybe you could add you know, another layer of detail to it or clean it up a bit. That's definitely the case for a lot of businesses, uh, big and small. Um, but just don't overlook the information that you already have. That might be your easiest insight into the kind of people that you could focus on. Remember how we talked about like identifying trends. Looking at your own data, you might find out, holy smokes, like all my customers are within a certain age range. If you have anything on them like business size or income level or anything like that, you might all, you know, you might start to really identify a few key factors that tell you, hey, this is the kind of person or uh, group of people that it makes most sense for me to talk to. And then another free one that I just wanted to mention is datausa.io. It's a uh, awesome website. Uh, assuming that you all are still seeing my screen, um, hopefully you're seeing the Data USA website. So awesome free information. A lot of it um, census data, um, geographically driven. So I can just type in um, any community. Um, I'll go Eagle River, Wisconsin, and you get loads of great information, mostly demographic, right? Um, to just help understand the makeup of that community. So this is super helpful if like, let's say you're looking at your own data and you're realizing, holy cow, like a lot of my customers are from this certain area. Um, I need to understand that group a little bit better. Or maybe you're looking to expand into an area for um, any number of reasons. Um, a great website to punch in that geographic area and understand uh, demographic info, info on the local economy, industries served in that community, um, just lots of really, really great information to maybe validate the thing that you're trying to do or the step you're going to take, or maybe make you say, hmm, you know, I don't know, maybe that's not uh, the place I need to be. So um, I'm not going to dive into that uh, any further, but um, definitely a really cool uh, and free resource. Uh, and then there's qualitative stuff, right? And these are the three that I mentioned before. So interviews, which can be super ad hoc uh, or really structured. Um, if you actually have like a retail presence or um, uh, or if you're interacting with clients, you know, uh, or customers anywhere along the way, it could be one question that you make sure you ask all of them so that you um, learn something about the question that you're asking, right? Um, so it could, it could be as simple as, you know, a one question thing that you're doing here and there or to every person that you're interacting with, or it could be really structured. You could actually ask people to come in and for an interview and ask the questions that you want to learn. Uh, and hopefully you've started to consider, um, you know, some of that local or your own information that you have and you're inviting in the people that are your most ideal client or, you know, are the persona that you've uh, developed. Look for those people. Um, use the information that you have to invite them in for something that's a bit more structured. So you're uh, really doing a bit of research. Survey is lots, same thing, can be uh, kind of ad, at will or ad hoc, or uh, can be, you know, a really structured kind of like a research project. And there's lots of great um, tools out there to conduct surveys, SurveyMonkey, Typeform, Google Form, lots of uh, really great, easy to use tools that can help, uh, help you build that and understand what you learn from it. Focus groups are one that are a bit more intensive. They definitely need structure. The people participating really need to understand the value. Why would they say yes to giving you their time? You may be, even need to compensate them, uh, maybe monetarily, maybe with, uh, I don't know, a, a freebie or discount on services or something like that. But getting permission for them to engage is really key. So um, those are some great ways to use the bigger data, the bigger information that you have, maybe some of that stuff like from your point of sale system or your email database, whatever you have, um, putting that up against, um, you know, some of this more qualitative stuff to just validate and verify results and things that you're actually seeing. So, and again, all of this is possible, but it does all take time. Don't feel like you need to do it all. If what you did was just took a deep dive into what you're learning from, uh, 
or took a deep dive into your own information, like your point of sale system uh, or your email database, your client database, customer database. Uh, if you did that and then uh, sprinkled on surveys with that, like just adding that little bit more uh, of research can really help you develop the persona that you're, uh, that'll really be most effective for your business and what you're trying to do. All right, and then we dive into actually creating our persona. So we've done some research. We've hopefully learned some things about our business, about our audience, maybe about a new market or a new area, a new uh, segment that we're trying to tap into. Um, and then we can actually start to dive into creating our persona. So um, the fir first step is segmentation. So let's understand those big buckets first. Um, and there's a whole lot of different ways to segment people into audiences. What you're seeing on screen here are uh, is a really cool free resource from uh, HubSpot. Um, just some awesome ways to segment customers based on things like what you're seeing on the screen. Maybe demographic, which is totally the most obvious, right? Um, I want to target people from 25 to 35 uh, with a certain income level that are all single, right? Uh, See you, Don. Thanks for being here for a little bit. Um, happy that you'll get to check out the recording. Um, and then there's all these other segments, right? Um, behavioral. And I, I think that um, we, we could probably spend a whole session on um, talking about segments, but I think um, it's really, Im or sorry about segmentation, but um, I think it's important to at least touch on a couple of examples here because Demographic segmentation is the most obvious one. It's the one that we always um, go to first because it's the easiest to see and understand. I can see that that person is a certain age. I can maybe see their ethnicity or their gender, um, or I have data on them about their marital status or their income level, right? So those are maybe the easiest to get to, but then all these other ones definitely take a, deep, take a bit more work or um, a deeper dive, or maybe we don't have as easy access to. Um, but um, we can learn these things through taking a deeper dive in, in the information that we already have or um, by doing some of those other uh, research uh, methods that we just talked about. The easiest example and one that I, I like to give a bit about how segmentation and doing it differently than just demographic um, is really valuable is um, using some like generational differences that we talk about often. Um, so, uh, a lot of our clients are uh, credit unions. And for the longest time, all that people talked about in the marketing space for credit unions was we got to be attractive to millennials, right? We need to focus on that uh, demographic. And when you defined a millennial, a lot of people, the first thing they talked about was the years that they were born, that age, that age range, right? Uh, and then maybe some of the um, first level of like behaviors that millennials had. So we knew that they were typically uh, behaving like mobile first. You know, they did most things on their mobile device first. They cared a lot about their community and service and ethical business practice. And when you dive deeper into what a millennial does, does with um, or how they behave um, outside of just understanding the demographic info of a millennial, um, you can learn a lot about them, uh, but you can also learn that those behaviors that we associate with millennials actually. Uh, go far beyond age. They go far beyond that generational label that we um, tend to lean on because it's really easy to see and identify, right? So um, when I think about people that are mobile first, that care about their community and community service, ethical business practice, that like to travel, things like that, we could be talking about my mom, who's almost 70 years old. We could be talking about my 13-year-old niece, and you know, really very similar behavior. So that's where behavioral segmentation can also be really valuable, depending on what kind of business you're running or what kind of product you're selling. If you don't care how old somebody is or um, whether or not they're married, but you just care that the first thing they do is pick up their phone or the first thing that they do is travel places or go into stores, that can help you understand them from a behavioral standpoint, not uh, just some of the more easy demographic standpoints. So, I'm starting with one of these segmentation methodologies to understand where that persona lives is a really helpful first step. So starting with segmentation, really important. Um, and then, um, you know, what we get out of all of this are, 
you know, as a competitive edge, we really understand people better. Uh, we can target better and we can hopefully improve our spend. If we know that the people that we're going after are mobile first thinking, um, maybe we can dedicate the money that we're spending to technology or ad delivery that delivers to devices like that instead of a billboard or something like that. And same thing other way around. Uh, and that's not to, I definitely don't mean to discredit traditional marketing methods like billboards and print and stuff like that. I owned a print shop for a dozen years. I definitely appreciate the value that that brings to the marketing mix, but um, not everybody's in those places. So understanding where people will see your message, where they'll hear from you, where they need to learn about you or interact with you um, is really important and segmentation can really help with that. Um, so when we talk about these next couple of tools like empathy maps and journey maps, those are the next two things we're gonna talk about. We're really focusing in on the person now. So we've maybe understood our segment. We've um, we've done our data. We've done our research. We've understood like a high level segment. Again, maybe based on demographic info, maybe based on things like behavior or uh, technology use, some of those other things that uh, were on the previous slide. And now we're going to actually focus in on a person. And we're going to develop a persona now. And a great first step to do that is to do um, an empathy map, which is just a really simple exercise to help you put yourself in the shoes of that person that you're trying to build or that person that you're trying to create. So you do this in a way that's as detailed as you can be with the information that you have, um, which might include some assumptions. But it might also be uh, assumptions that are rooted in data or research or things that you've learned in the earlier part of the process. So you actually define a person, you give them a name, uh, and you put them right in the center of the box, right? So like in that person circle that you're seeing on the screen, you would write Jane Smith, whatever. You'd share a little bit more information like um, demographics, marital status, whether or not they're working, um, lots of other stuff. Uh, to help um, really define who that person is. Do they have kids? What's their typical workday look like? Um, where do they go on vacation? You know, and really like focusing in on trying to almost like build a human, like this virtual human, right? And then you start to um, go around the block here and talk about what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, um, what they're hearing from their family, what they're hearing in the community, what they're hearing from their boss at work. Uh, and how is that making them feel? You know, so really, I mean, when I say putting yourself in their shoes, like really putting yourself in their shoes to help understand their experience, their human experience and what they're going through. And all of this can feel a little kumbaya or a bit more abstract, but you have to think um, if what you're trying to do is get somebody to dedicate their resources, their time, their money, whatever it is to you, to buy something from you or to learn something from you or to share something with you, to understand what's influencing how they feel and how they think during the day or at night or whatever, um, really can help you understand what your message might need to sound like, um, what your graphics might need to look like, what your website need, might, might need to look like, where your message needs to go. So it's a really, really helpful uh, exercise to help really focus in on that persona. And we're already building that persona by doing this empathy map, right? Um, but there's a, a couple other tools that I'll share real quickly here that can guide you through the process to help define that person. Journey mapping is another one. There's all kinds of different journey maps that you can uh, create to uh, help understand someone's experience, which could be um, some of these uh, examples that you're seeing on screen here uh, could be like a day in their life that's probably the most uh, closely aligned to an empathy map, like walking through someone's day. They wake up, they make breakfast, they go to work, they uh, have a commute, they don't, uh, they work upstairs in their corner office like I am, you know, whatever that is, and really like flowing through their day. Um, maybe it's your buyer journey, right? So how does somebody learn about you? When they come into their store, what do they see? What do they smell? What do they experience? And really like mapping out that whole process. And the point of all of that is to see it, right? Like to see the map out in front of you um, and understand that process. And it's all about the point of journey mapping is to really identify those critical touch points that you might be able to influence and do something about, right? 
Um, this is especially helpful, like if you're getting any kind of feedback that uh, your website's not easy to use, or I don't know how to get in touch with you, or things like that, to do this practice where you're actually putting yourself in their shoes and, or maybe even doing it yourself, right? Like this is why, like, uh, secret shoppers were, you know, really helpful once upon a time, maybe retail places are still using them, but um, to see like objectively, um, where is like, where's the disconnect or where is that critical touch point where maybe the experience is even good, you know, maybe it's totally satisfactory, they're getting what they want from you. But by journey mapping, you can find like that, that's a touch point that people are getting what they expect, but I can make that awesome. And that might mean that they come back to me, or that might mean that they tell their sibling or their kid or their best friend, like, hey, you got to go check this place out too. So it's not always about like fixing the problems. It could be enhancing something or building on something that you've already created. Um, there's some really great tools to help create journey maps out there, real, um, free ones. Um, the one that you're seeing on screen here is called Miro. It's one of my favorites, uh, really simple to use to help lay things out virtually. You can use sticky notes on a wall or on a desk, um, mural, HubSpot, or just a simple spreadsheet or other ways that you can uh, build a journey map like this to, again, just hopefully identify those critical touch points that you might want to focus on. So that's, you know, taking the persona uh, and going another level deep. So I understand the person, I understand who I'm trying to reach. Um, and now I'm trying to focus in on this one experience in their day or this one interaction uh, in their day, this one experience that they have in my buying journey. Uh, and you can really create change because you're super focused in on something that could be uh, really big for them. So uh, finally, creating personas. So all the stuff that we're bringing together, we're under, we've under, we're understanding why we need them, done the research and data, we've done that segmentation, empathy and journey maps. And then we actually um, can put the finishing touches on who our persona is. And you actually like build a person. So you've maybe already started to do this if you've done some empathy mapping by giving them a name and a job and some of these things that you're seeing on screen here, um, but you actually do all of this for them. And two of my favorites that I think are most helpful with the world that we're living in now, uh, because marketing and advertising are everywhere, um, our media usage and brand affinities. So I think those are two really cool questions or uh, characteristics to build into your persona. So, you know, the, the, the media platforms and the um, channels that they use. Um, and they, that understanding that really can impact how and where you reach them. And then brand affinities. So what brands do they interact with? What brands do they like? Um, and that can really provide uh, some really big hints as to what kind of content they like, what they respond to, um, and, you know, can really help kind of deepen the understanding uh, of your persona. So you'll actually build all of these um, characteristics. And uh, what I will share with Zia that will share out, uh, be shared out with you are some links to some free online tools that are um, kind of like a, like, almost like a survey experience where you actually build your persona um, using like a web-based platform and it kicks out uh, all the information that you gave it and gives them a name and all that stuff, some, some really cool free tools out there. Okay, so I'm, uh, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to share just a couple of examples uh, and then hopefully leave a few minutes for questions. Um, and I just want to share, uh, again, I'm going to share a couple of like big brand examples uh, of how I think focusing on a persona, focusing on in a person, on a human, uh, can change the way that something looks, feels, and sounds. Um, and then some local examples too. Uh, of course, so full disclosure, one example is going to be from Apple. The other is going to be from Procter & Gamble. Um, big brands, huge budgets, lots of capability to create really cool looking stuff. I'll share those. Uh, it doesn't have to be so big all the time. So I'll share some local examples too. That might just be like picking the right image when you're uh, creating something. So uh, I'm going to hit play on this video. If you're not hearing any audio or anything, give me a thumbs down or some kind of visual sign. Uh, and um, a pre apologies if you have to listen to an ad before the video plays. Okay, here we go. Here's one from Apple. And yeah, here's an ad. I'm getting a survey. This is what we believe technology alone is not enough. 
faster, thinner, lighter. Those are all good things. But when technology gets out of the way, everything becomes more delightful, even magical. That's when you leap forward. That's when you end up with something like this. This is what... So I like that one because it's the iPad 2, which is like a super old device. I don't know when this is from. I should probably have found out like when that commercial is from, but it's old, but it's still so good in that, um, you know, Apple at the time really like refocused some of their efforts on a new segment of the market. The business person that wants to use devices that make their job more efficient and effective. That's their persona, right? Like business person cares about efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and, you know, I think that it shows um, lots of stuff that speaks to them from a professional standpoint. You saw stocks and brain scans and things like that, but you also saw pictures of their family and like, you know, look at the world that we live in now where we're all carrying around this thing, you know, our phone or even our laptops, our iPads, our devices, whatever we're doing. We carry those things around to get work done. Uh, because we're always connected, right? But we're also using those things every single day to take pictures of our kids or pictures of the vacation that we're on. Um, and I think that, you know, that ad that you saw is just a small part of Apple's strategy, I think, to connect people, uh, connect people's lives and, you know, good or bad, maybe bridge the gap between um, work and everyday life, right? Uh, I'm going to skip this and well i'll play just the first couple uh maybe 30 seconds of this one because it's uh, a little longer and we only have so much time Then I'm not hearing any audio. I thought that was normal. I just thought it was a bunch of pictures. Well, here I said I was only going to play 30 seconds of it, but I got sucked into it. So, um, you know, just an awesome example, Procter & Gamble, you saw the brands flash there at the end. They didn't talk about product once in the whole thing. Um, using a super captive uh, audience in the right moment of the Olympics, which, you know, again, big brand here. We don't have uh, the ability to advertise in the Olympics, but uh, or, you know, not all of us do. Um, but, you know, totally tapping into mom, you know, and, you know, that person, and the role that they played in the lives of, you know, the Olympians that you saw from childhood up through, you know, seeing the success at the Olympics, just an awesome example of focusing on mom and, uh, you know, looking at the brands and the products that Procter and, Gam Procter and Gamble puts out there, like who's buying that stuff? You know, it's almost always mom, right? So just two really cool examples, uh, big scale examples, um, and now some more local ones. So, you know, Quick Trip, certainly no small company, um, but, you know, a small business in the grand scheme of things. 
um, their merch. You know, this uh, this shirt that shows the Wisconsin license plate as, um, you know, part of, you know, really built into the design. Quick Trip, a very proud Wisconsin company. If you follow their social media, you know, you see all the time uh, they're uh, super proud of it and uh, brag about it. And their roots in Wisconsin are really deep and it's a part of their brand. And um, certainly when they're developing a persona, uh, probably one of the first things that uh, they define is this person lives in Wisconsin uh, or at least travels here often, right? So I'm not sure what their expansion plan looks like and how this kind of stuff can be made specific to uh, places outside of the state. But um, this is where, you know, a persona, you know, a lot of our talk today has been about how it can influence things like marketing messages and sales efforts and stuff. But, you know, here, I think it shows how it can influence a product. Um, this uh, really cool business in Stevens Point, Fall Line Outfitters, uh, cool shop uh, downtown Stevens Point that sells all kinds of gear and uh, apparel and uh, really cool stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm whether they did real persona work and identified a person, I, I don't know if I just found these examples. I didn't reach out to anyone here. Um, so whether or not they did real persona work, I don't know. But, you know, there's at least an understanding of the kind of people that come into a business like that, um, that care about the outdoors, that care about um, the planet and their sport and things like that. So um, this ad that you see about uh, them selling some merch for a cause, you know, starting to build an affinity with the people that buy from them by saying, hey, you care about your sport, you care about what you wear while you're doing it, you care about um, businesses that practice, um, you know, putting their money where their mouth is and supporting the community and supporting organizations that support the things that support us. Um, just a real beneficial relationship here by helping to push merch that helps support a cause. Um, so like that's a pretty tactical thing by creating a, an effort to build that connection with the persona or build an affinity with your uh, customer. Um, the example all the way to the right is also from Fall Line Outfitters. This is just a social media ad that I found of theirs. And again, maybe they just got lucky. I didn't verify any uh, work that they had done here, uh, any research that went into this, but the picture, like if I think of the kind of person that's going to go into an outdoor um, sporting goods store that sells apparel and fishing gear and hunting gear and things like that, like, can you pick a better picture? Like when I, when I think of that person in my brain, I think of somebody like this, that's slinging the gear over their shoulder, you know, that, you know, maybe it's just throwing a cap on before they leave for the trip or, you know, whether that's fishing or hunting or whatever. So, you know, and all of these decisions can feel big, like, oh, which picture do I use? And you can feel like you need to do all this research and everything that we talked about today to make that right decision. But after you do it, after you understand the, the human that you're trying to interact with and their space uh, inside a bigger segment or within the world, um, this stuff can really become secondhand. It can become a part of your brand. It can become a part of who you are as a business or an organization, and it can happen almost automatically or really mindlessly after you do it enough and after you really feel confident and understand uh, the persona that you've created and all the work that went into it. Uh, last one that I'll share here are um, on the left is a cool coffee shop in downtown Marshfield called Uptown Coffee. The other one on the right is called uh, The Daily Grind. Two coffee shops a couple blocks away from each other in downtown Marshfield. Definitely catering to different people, to different humans. Uh, and Daily Grind has been around for, I don't even know, I think the 80s or 70s was when they started. They just went through an ownership change. Um, uh, somebody that had worked there for a long time just bought it. They've got a look and feel, very traditional coffee shop, chalkboard menu, all of those things. Kind of a messy feel in there, but great food, great coffee. When Uptown came around, which was about four years ago now, they knew that Daily Grind already existed. And they knew that there's people that like to get coffee maybe in a place that's a bit quieter, maybe a bit more contemporary, um, you know, creates just a totally different experience. And it's kind of like Target and Walmart to go back to another like big example, like there are people that go to Walmart and there are people that go to Target and sure they cross over. I go to both of them, um, but you feel something different when you go into those two places. And that's, you know, definitely built uh, intentionally and with some research and um, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. 
Uh, so again, these will all be shared, but these are those persona builders that I was talking about. So um, HubSpot, Adobe, and then a really cool example on LinkedIn as well um, that can help walk you through the process um, to um, take some of the research that you have and put it out there uh, and help actually build uh, your person. I am pre I, I'm at time. I'm gonna like lightning. I told Zia before we started, I probably put together too much information. And sure enough, I did. Um, but I'm just gonna lightning through this stuff and just give you a little um uh preview of some of the stuff that you'll see in the recap email. Um, I always like to spend a minute on brand because as we're talking about people and what we're creating uh for um keeping your brand in mind that you know we're creating consistency, we can create two different personas and they both might be really important to our business and um, they might be two completely different people, but your brand does need to, you know, fall somewhere uh, that it speaks to both of them, you know, and it can be specific and you can create different experiences through your brand, but um, there needs to be consistency there too. So you're not creating confusion for people outside of those two personas that you've created. I was going to talk a lot about uh, innovation to kind of help drive home some of that um, information about um, revising and updating your persona over time. So I'm going to I'm going to pass by like three slides really quick here. But um, two things that I want to touch on are a couple of worksheets that I'll share that are really helpful in that process to like redefine and redefine, uh, refine and define or redevelop as you're going. Um, so like if as you develop a persona, you're, um, you decide, hey, I need to create this new customer experience or this new product or uh, this new marketing message, uh, this death threats worksheet is really helpful because you can put that thing that you're trying to create or do front and center and then um, ask yourself some questions along the way that can really be a proactive way to um, get you to, yes, I should proceed with this thing that I think I learned by doing this persona work or no, like either I don't have the time, the resources or what I'm gonna benefit from it really aren't going to um, help me. So you just ask yourself these questions and you answer them, maybe have a team around you to help give you an objective answer and make sure that you're not too biased in your answer. to again, just help you before you get too deep into a change that you're trying to create or a campaign that you're creating or a marketing message that you're writing and wrecking your brain on. Um, asking one of these questions or all of these questions might help you decide, yep, I'm on the right track or nope, I need to go a different route. And the other one is this gut check exercise, which is just a real quick hitter to help you analyze and check your assumptions um, and make sure that, especially if you have a team, that you're all on the same page and you're working towards something um, in a way that's really aligned and together. Um, so just answering, asking the really simple question, like, do you love it? And like, honestly answering it, um, yes or no, you know, might be all that you need to do to gut check yourself and say, eh, I'm not really feeling it. Okay, cool. Take a step back, think about your persona, uh, do something different and just to never stop innovating and just, you know, continue to give that persona or, um, more research, uh, you know, give more time to those things because it does pay off, um, by doing that groundwork. So, Okay. Whew, deep breath for me. Like I said, I'd talk fast. I'm so sorry. Um, I, we're, I, I'm done with my presentation. I've got plenty of time if there's any questions or anything. So back to you, Z. Well, Ben, thank you so much. I love all the information and resources that you gave us. Um, so yeah, so we're going to open it up to you. Any questions that the attendees may have. So feel free to unmute yourself or throw questions into the chat for us. Thank you. Any questions at all, anybody? <laughs> Uh, this is Janine. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So um, when it comes to branding and building your strategy, um, especially with rebranding and everything like that, do you suggest that it takes, I know you just can't dive in with both, jump in with both feet and say, oh, I'm going to rebrand or, oh, I'm going to do something different. But you said to have one brand, you could include both of your different, uh, both of the different sides of it. So would that mean that striking out with your brand and focusing on one first and then bringing the other one in or focusing on both of them without having to go through, well, I think I'm going to rebrand re for this for a little while. And about how long should that take? 
Oof. Yeah, so great I know a question. lot of information. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, uh, good question, and you know, I'm sure there's a lot of it depends that I could throw at you, but um, I mean, I I do think that um, you know maybe just to give you some sort of answer that isn't totally diplomatic and right in the middle, it probably makes sense to focus on one over the other. Um, and that might be defined based on like the greatest value that you see from the other, whether that's, you know, an increase in business or sales or um, something like that, depending on, again, what your business is. Um, so, yeah, I would say focusing on one. But when you're when you're talking about a rebrand, I mean, um, you know, if it's a true rebrand with like completely different name or um, um, even a brand refresh, that's a bit. Uh, you know, maybe your name stays the same, but you're going to create a whole new look and feel or a whole new experience. Um, you know, those are really, that's a really key opportunity to create a whole lot of traction and engagement and excitement, or it could be an opportunity to create a whole bunch of confusion and desertion, right? So um, I think that's where it's, you know, most important to take care of the people that have gotten you to where you are, or are maybe the people that are most likely to do work with you if you're, you know, earlier on in, in your journey. Um, and so maybe that reinforces the um, initial answer of focusing on one persona or, you know, um, not trying to please everyone and staying somewhere in the middle, focus on the people that you think you can reap the most benefit from or that need to stay loyal to you um, because what you provide is most valuable to them. Uh, and go from there. I don't know if I'm really accurately answering the question about rebrand because there's just so many factors that can go into that. And you know, from a timing standpoint, um, I mean that could be could be a rather quick process depending on the setup of your business uh, and the size of your audience, the size of your current clientele. Um, it could be a, a multi-year process. I guess I would just say, don't ever feel like you need to do that by yourself, and that isn't. Um, some sneaky pitch to have somebody like me help you with that or anything. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot to consider things like how, especially if you're doing a name change, how changing your name, if you have any kind of online presence right now, how changing your name can really impact whether or not people will find your website or your social media or your Google listing and things. There's just so much really important work that needs to happen as part of the technical side of that process to make sure that people can find you. Um, and then, of course, there's all the legal things to trademark and naming and things like that. So it, it can be a really deep and extensive process if, again, depending on what kind of rebrand it is. So thank I you. The reason helpful. I asked that is because I'm just starting my business, but I have two specific areas that I'm focusing on. So if I just okay. focus on one, if I were to bring in the second piece in a year bigger than the first piece, would I have to go through the process of trying to not necessarily rebrand but change and maybe it is a rebrand to change things because right now I'm balancing two pieces without opening a business so I'm trying to get all of these things put together I really want to kind of finish before I say hey this is what I'm doing I want the website I want the brand I want the persona I want all of that done so it looks like it's just been flowing yeah. for a long time and nobody's ever heard of it that's my goal <laughs> do you think you know enough about that second group where you could create for them now and you could kind of create both I actually have created, in fact, in fact, the idea cannot work unless both parties are together. Okay. I have to have both parties together okay. um, because without, without the two parties, one cannot survive. Well, I mean, one can survive without the other, but it's beautiful when they both are together. And that's the objective. I, I can do them both as standing alone, but it really is in harmony when both pieces are together. So I can teach virtual classes to one to the employer, the employers, as well as the clients. But I'd rather be able to teach these courses so that they all come together and they can see how well this works out. And I also don't like duplications of service. So I really don't want to have to teach consistently to all the same people. I kind of want to teach, teach, and then have them go out and do it. Kind of like a kindergarten teacher. We're all gonna we're all gonna talk about what it goes, and then you're gonna show me you know how to do it. We're gonna play pretend and then we're gonna go outside and we're really gonna do it. And then I'm gonna see how great this is. And then yeah. that's going to be it. And then we'll learn something else or you'll learn something else down the line. <laughs> right. Yeah. And maybe what you learned is what you've created for the first group works perfectly for the second and all is good. Uh, another um, way that it could go is, um, well, hopefully you don't learn the opposite that what you created is not resonating or you know anything like that. But 
um, maybe even like a sub brand for the second group, you know, just like a, a play on the first one or something that's different but connected um, might okay. be a way to, you know, create resonation with that second group. So, yeah. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed listening to this. I did have to say goodbye to my class because I teach virtually. So um, I was that's listening good. and also saying goodbye and answering their questions. All good. I get it. Yeah, we're all doing a lot. Glad you could be here. Any more additional questions for Ben? Well, it doesn't seem like it. So I, I mean, it's a, like I said, it's a beautiful day and I don't want to keep anybody. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to end the presentation. Um, but if you do have additional questions, you know, please send it my way. Uh, and ho hopefully I can forward that to Ben. Um, a reminder that we have another presentation this Thursday uh, for online marketing. And I will, again, also add that link um, into the email if you do, did enjoy this presentation. And if you're not registered for Thursday, do um, register because Ben will also be doing a presentation this Thursday as well. So, well, Ben, thank you so much for today's session. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, have a good rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great night. You too.